So, Mildred, for this prize, you're focused entirely on the very, very small, as opposed to the very, very large for astro astrophysics and the very complex for neuroscience. But with such a long and distinguished career, it's difficult to know, you know what, what that actually means. So perhaps could you start by telling us how you started as a scientist? Oh, how I started as yeah. a scientist? Okay. Uh, well... I think we all start as a scientist when we start studying science. And so as a student, I was always interested in thinking of a career oh, was out of my range. I, I never saw a scientist, female scientist. That wasn't too well known in my time, of any sort, let, let, let alone uh, nanoscience. So. Um, well, I suppose nanoscience didn't exist as a field no, when didn't. you started, but well, as you say, there were very few, maybe no, female physicists at, the, at that time. Yeah. Was that a barrier for you? What sort of obstacles did you come up against? Well, it, it didn't turn out to be much of a barrier because uh, Sputnik came along in 1957. I got my PhD in 1958. Perfect time, right? And so there were opportunities for anybody that could uh, produce some interesting work. And so I started my independent career in 1960. Oh, that was perfect time. And uh, I was, I had an idea, inspiration about nano from uh, the very beginning um, when I started my independent career. So uh, Sputnik came along, as I, I told you. And uh, this meant that uh, there was money available to do crazy things. <laughs> and um, the job I had at Lincoln Lab, at that time I had a boss, uh, Ben Lax, and um, he had people doing all kind of semiconducting materials. We had a very high magnetic field, so we had some unusual techniques. And um, other people were working on one semiconductor after another. And, but I, I told them that I didn't really want to do this, but uh, let's work on something that's a little bit different. So I learned the techniques. I spent a half a year or so learning the techniques so I could do these kinds of experiments. And then I, I was motivated by working on something that was really possibility of doing something nano-like. So that was uh, this linear E versus K that was produced by a single layer of graphene. We didn't call it graphene that time. We, we called it a single layer of graphite. So, so that's really interesting that you say that because in a sense much of your work presaged the discoveries that, 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 followed. that followed. So graphene was one, but also yeah. carbon nanotubes, but also yes. fullerenes. Yeah, that's correct, yes. So how, 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 what does it feel like to have your research validated after, after you've, you've already done it? Oh, well, you know, I never cared about being validated or, <laughs> or anything. And the people in the field, we, we all knew each other. So that was, that was just fine. Singling out an event such as Sputnik as being the sort of trigger for, for uh, a many decades long career is, is a re really interesting thing to, ha to happen to someone. I, I sort of wonder whether what are going to be those landmarks for the next generation of scientists or what, what are going to be the things where um, in you know, decades to come people will say, oh, well, this happened. Oh, yes. Uh, well, some possibilities of, of our generation that might make, trigger something like that as well in, 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 the, in the U.S. now, uh, we have, have money to do sort of venturesome things with new initiatives. I think the Obama administration, we have Paul Chu there, and he's a really, uh, he's just a, um, an amazing guy in his own research, and he has uh, visions. So uh, I think that, that we have some people out there that are willing to make some gambles um, in doing uh, novel work. I'm uh, on advisory board of the Packard Foundation, 
and um, the Scientific Advisory Board. We, we give awards to very um, young uh, faculty members in all fields of science. Oh, the foundation does. I'm just on the advisory committee. And uh, those people get a chance to do the same kind of thing that I got a chance to do. So uh, it, it, those kind of opportunities are available. And in Europe, you have something, uh, something similar, could be similar, the flagship program. I don't know that the money be used for that, but it, it has the potential of being like the Packard program. Uh, you, you mentioned that the, when, you, when you were in that lab um, yeah. in the 1960s, that it was the challenge of doing something completely different. That but I had the opportunity. I had the opportunity to do something that um, if, if I succeeded, it was good. If I didn't succeed, you know, then I would be doing something that the boss wanted me to do. And it succeeded. It su I was lucky because I tried many things in my career. And... Um, they succeeded, and because they succeeded, I was given some freedom. So uh, uh, the U.S. has, has uh, something called National Science Foundation, and I, I got a grant when I became a professor back in the 1960s. I still have that NSF grant, and, and it's that little bit of money. It's, now it, it supports one student. You know, the grants in the U.S. support one student. But I use that money for precisely that, to do things that are uh, uh, a little bit crazy. They don't all work, but I, all of those things that we talk about and they were created that way. Well, that should be the model and, for well, science. I, ha I, have, I have two things. I have uh, a little uh, fund from MIT. I have a chair that I got in 1973 that, uh, from um, a philanthropist called Rockefeller. I think you've heard about Rockefeller. <laughs> so he gave money for science. And, um, I, ha and I had a chair that gave me freedom. It wasn't a whole lot of money that I, I have, but, but it's, it's, I have the freedom. You don't need a lot of money to get something started. And once it's good, then you get funding from regular channels. During that process, was there, did you ever feel any pressure to be more productive or to produce a sort of transferable technology from your, from your research? Okay, there are two different things. So uh, did I have a, a compulsion to produce something um, productive that I was sure about? I always made sure that I did that because when you have a grant, um, uh, you want to fulfill what you promise in the grant. Scientists have to be honest and they have to not take money unless they come through with results for what they take money for. So all these creative things are in addition to. So I have money, I do what I'm supposed to do, but I do something more. And I think that that's, uh, we need uh, the grants, the grant monitors to uh, permit that sort of thing, that if you do what you're supposed to do, and then you do something more, then it's encouraged. So the, the, the Kavli Prize itself is, is an award for basic research, for pure research, and not the practical applications of, of that research. But I suppose more than in the other categories, yours is a field where the basic research often lends itself to new technologies. That is correct. So was, was there, did, did, you, did you feel that, that ever the balance between doing the pure research and the, and the transferable research was, was ever out of kilter? Well, not in my case. Uh, I, I had some advantage in that regard. So uh, uh, the research I focused on myself, uh, is basic research, and it's sort of covely type research, okay? Uh, but I work at an institution that has many visitors from industry. That's MIT. And we have something called industrial liaison. And those people are always talking to people, doing, working on materials of interest. And I'm very happy to come and talk to them about what I do. And uh, materials that I've worked on have seen many applications, and I've been sort of responsible for giving ideas for applications. I don't do the applications myself, but I'm happy to give people the ideas, and they will work on the applications. They can have the patents. 
Sometimes I get the patents along with them, but I'm not really that interested in that aspect. And I'm very happy that the research that I'm doing has impact on society. But I don't do it myself. And MIT is very happy with that arrangement. So let's talk about some of the research uh, it, itself. So, so perhaps you, you mentioned earlier we talked about what is now called graphene, but single, single sheets mm -hmm. of carbon. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you could explain w what it was about that material that, that was of particular interest to you. Well, it, it, it was, from a scientific standpoint, it was very basically different from anything else in nature. And it had this linear dispersion relation. Like, this gets a little bit technical. But to a physicist, this was very unusual. And from a topological standpoint, uh, also different. Because it has degeneracies that are connected with the symmetry of that particular material. So, I mean, that goes back to the beginning of history with it. And so when we were working out the band structure, we were aware of all of those things, and that's in our papers, you know, from all the time. And uh, so I was right there doing. So uh, the French Navy and the U.S. Navy both were interested in improving the performance of their submarines. And so they wanted to have a source of power that uh, was stealth-like, you know, that uh, you could produce power from waste energy. Well, companies are also interested in this, if you like that better for nature. So uh, uh, there's a, the world is producing heat, you know, when it goes up the chimney. So if we could, uh, uh, cars, there's the exhaust. If you can use the energy that goes out in the exhaust for something useful, that's pretty good. So what I do allows you to do that. So take advantage it, it, of that. Explain how that works. If the, the, the heat is being distributed, what, it, what is it about the materials that you were working with that allows you to capture or work with that exhaust? Well, the, the concept is that uh, there was a period from 1960 to 1990 that there was absolutely no, no progress made, almost no progress. The field was pretty much dead was of almost no literature because people didn't have any ideas how to do energy conversion from waste heat to electricity, which is useful heat, useful uh, use of energy. So if you could transform waste heat into electricity, that would be good. And, and the mechanism for that, technically, is a the thermoelectric effect, which was discovered in 1800 something. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a very old effect. And uh, so people knew that there must be some kind of way to exploit this because the efficiency was very low. And so I was asked by different people. I teach at a very famous university. So maybe I know something that's interesting to somebody. So that's why they came to me to ask me about that. And I thought about it and I said, I don't really know how to solve this problem, but I would try to do it by uh, introducing a, the concept that materials of very small size will scatter lattice vibrations effectively, and we could use that concept to improve this conversion between waste heat, because instead of when it scatters light, energy is thrown away, if we could use that waste energy to make electricity, it would be good. And is this, and this is a property which is unique to the nano world, right? Yes, it is unique to the nano world. There are many properties unique to the nano world, and that's why people talk about graphene as having many applications. Some of those applications have to do with the fact that it's a nano material. So uh, your question was correct in that you wanted to know, because we were talking about uh, uh, nano from, from uh, uh, talking about graphene. So it was the nano aspect of materials that makes them better thermoelectrics. And so you, you mentioned that there was not a lot of progress in this field until the a 1990s. Lot for, for many, many years. And, um, uh, but both the auto industry and um, submarines, 
were interested in, in the same problem. And so what happened? What was the, what was the, the breakthrough that, that re, re, uh, re, reinvigorated okay. the field? Well, uh, it was the idea that, uh, well, I proposed. I wrote a paper with a student, and uh, it, it just took us, like, two weeks to write this paper. Because the student walked in, I gave him a, uh, I said, you know, this is a homework problem, but I think people are interested in it. Let's see if it works. So I, I told him that we, we did a very, uh, like a toy problem. We, we just considered that you had a thin film of material X. And uh, if we considered using it as a thermoelectric, how would it compare for the same material in bulk form? Mm -hmm. And... We got the amazing result that it would be very much better, okay? So we published that, and people were excited about it. So, okay, uh, then we, the referee wrote back, gee, this is an interesting uh, concept. Usually when you write a paper, you don't get that back. You get feedback from the, from the editor. This is interesting. Why don't you do more with this? So, uh, so we tried it in, in one dimension. We did a quantum wire. It was even better. And that's how the field got started. And we just, uh, that, that was, we wrote two theory papers, three theory papers actually, just total theory. And then uh, we went to the lab and we demonstrated that the theory was correct in the laboratory to make real material and prove. It, it, that's quite a rare story. I mean, it's a wonderful story that you can think There's of. There's no money involved in the beginning of this. You just you, you, you dream up something and, and think it through. Yeah, well, all the, all the papers, there was no money. Uh, I, I, there was no support. We just did it. We just wrote the papers. Do you think there's a model there for scientists working in, in for young scientists working in the labs today? That seems like an un, unusual situation to me. Uh, well, it wasn't unusual because uh, uh, let me just explain how it happened. Uh, when I, I take on a new student, this is a new student, he just walked in the door, he's a smart guy. We have a lot of smart students coming in. And, uh, and I give them a practice problem. This is just a practice problem. And we wanted to get to know each other. So I, I've been thinking about this. Why don't you try this out? This is the way I, I, would, I would solve it myself. Sit down and do it and see if it's right. Uh, and he came back and it was right. And then I said, well, the next thing to do is to prove that it's really right, because you can do it in the laboratory, then you know, you want to know if the theory is right. Do you get a buzz from those sort of results when you send someone out and they come back and... Well, you see, the thing was, was so we published these papers, and uh, the audience was almost zero because there was no literature, so people didn't know where to look. So it took a while for people to recognize that we even wrote these papers. And uh, then, with time, it, it became better known. So, um, the, the next thing was proof of demonstration. So, and then mass, mass. Because if you have a nano object, you don't produce a, a, a lot of uh, thermal energy into electricity, right? It's just tiny amounts if you have a tiny object. So you have to have some kind of multiplier, mass of multiplier by an many orders of magnitude to cool your, your, your seat in the car or, or your exo take, take use of the exhaust gas in the car. So uh, um, that, that, that those experiments were done by making nanocomposites. So we took many of the, of the little nano things and we compressed them into a sample that had many nano per unit volume and then made something that actually... So everything was done in steps. D is, is, um... So now, now it's, it's, it's an industrial... So it's not really a, a big industrial process, but the companies are beginning to use, use it for, in the auto industry. Scaling up the nano world into the no, macro world. We don't world. do that. I mean, the, the auto, auto companies do that. Is, is that. is that one of the big obstacles for, for the translational science of, of, of looking at the nano world? Well, it, it, it's in this... It, okay, it, it, there's a step. So we do the nano uh, uh, experiments, and we show feasibility. And then there's a scale-up period. Uh, industry has to be involved with that, because they have to have all the uh, conditions right. 
and and I think that that uh, the university could just do a mini uh, a demo, demo project, just just so feasibility uh, of how to go about. Uh, that is, before you pass it off to industry, the uh, researcher has to do the next step because the company doesn't know exactly how to do the multiplication in the beginning. So you have to help the company to understand how to use the nano system to make a prototype model. And then the company takes off. Because they know how much better than any person in the university, I guess, how to make real products. So, so it's, you're talking about converting the basic research into right. an industrial process. Exactly, exactly. And uh, I'm, I'm at a university that has people that know all of these different steps. So I go to somebody, I say, you know, we, we discovered something. Tell me if this is interesting. You know. That's quite a luxury to, to, to be in such a strong position where you can uh, think yeah. about something and well, there are, present it. Uh, uh, the old Bell Labs was exactly like that. It was even better because they, they went searching for, and, and, and the, the bosses went searching for what you were doing. For just good ideas. Yeah, for good ideas, and then they would run off with them. So it's, it's that Linus Pauling phrase, isn't it? The best way to have good ideas is to have lots of ideas. Yeah, right. And, and they, they don't all pan out. Uh, but you have to try them, and you have to take them through the pilot stage and then go on. And then even when they go to the next stage, it's not necessarily commercial success. So. Do you think that science has changed over, over the decades in terms of being less capable of, of giving you that, that kind of intellectual freedom? Uh, so I, well, uh, it's, it's like this. If, you, if the a thing that you, is, that you discovered is so darn expensive, I mean, some a aspects of, uh, say, the, the IC um, technology world, um, y you, you need the capabilities of, of a pretty wealthy company to take ideas and, and to scale them up because the machinery is so expensive. Mm. But uh, uh, some, at the fundam all the things I've, I've done are at a very fundamental level. So that could be done with, with a one graduate student and, and uh, then with the proper um, liaison to companies interested in the work, then you, you can get some commercialization. So with, with those one graduate students, you must have had a fair few of, over the years. Yes, I've had. Um, what, would you, what would your advice be to a new graduate student joining your lab today, or anyone who's have, starting out in science? Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and do good work and something is likely to turn out to be successful and, and might even be useful commercially. Um, many of my students have become very wealthy from their uh, uh, things that they, they did, not necessarily with me, but later on. But through having fun and hard work. Yes. I mean, there's a fun and a hard work uh, aspect, and uh, in companies, it's the same way. It's, I don't know about the fun part of a company, because if you're a startup com company, you don't have very many options. You have to be, is, you have survival as uh, I don't know, main uh, uh, agenda item. But in the framework of a, of a, a university, you've got the liberty of uh, That's just experimenting. That, that, that's correct, and, and I, I think that to the degree that a student can, can have some contact with the practical applications, if they're working in nanoscience, it's not a bad thing. It's not for all students. Some students uh, just don't have the interest or talent, but they're good at something else. Okay, let them do that part. If they're really good at it, that's fine. And, and some people are good at everything. I've had students like that. And okay, they can do everything. Well, congratulations and thank you, okay. Mildred Dresselhaus.